if you can sail close to the breeze and get away with it like we did, you, you don't feel, oh, it's not embarrassed, but it, you fortunate probably. Like, so when other mothers and fathers ring me and say, this is where we are at, and, and I don't, I try and give them hope, but there is no certainty. Mm. The fact that Miller now walks into my bedroom in the mornings or at night, or I get to hold her hand and put her on the bus. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's happening. The Imperfects invites you into a very safe place. A place where we share without judgment and drink heaps of vulnerability. Grab yourself a cup. This is the Vulnerability House. A big week demands a big man and a big name <laughs> <laughs> in the in the world of sport or in just in the world, really. Mm. Uh, a man so important that I genuinely felt the need to wear a collar. Today. <laughs> 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 That's true. That's I, true. I, I wore a collar because I was like, I feel like Hamish McLaughlin demands a collar. <laughs> and, uh, and so hence I have a collar. And we welcome Hamish McLaughlin to the Vulnerability House. Nice to be here, Ryan. Thank you for having me, Hugh, Josh. Nice to meet you. I, it's funny, I've been listening to this since day one, I think, and been watching you, Ryan, for years. And Hugh, you, I've had a huge impact on our family, so it's good to be here. Yeah, oh, it's very, very exciting. I mean, this is airing on Monday. Okay. So the grand final... So to give the result, even though we're recording on Wednesday, yeah, you may as well. <laughs> <laughs> you may as it's Geelong well. by three points. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. Gee, I hope that happens. <laughs> yeah, <isn't it? laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Uh, another another sort of strange little tidbit. Um, assuming this is going out on Monday, it's my birthday. So happy birthday. It, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. It's my birthday. Oh, happy not, birthday. not today, but it will be on Monday when happy this birthday. airs. So make a big deal about it. Happy birthday. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> what, what did you get this morning? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just a collar. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Not a polo shirt. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that you are the you are the voice of sport in this country. <laughs> yeah. Olympics, Commonwealth Games, um, football. Tennis. Tennis. Tennis? Yeah. We, we, for 13 years, tennis. Uh, Channel 9's had it for a couple, but hopefully we get it back. But I think Bruce will always be the voice, but it's nice to be in Bruce's shadow and even discussed <laughs> in that sort of a, a way. We've been I've been unbelievably lucky because we've had on seven – Football, racing, Olympics, com games, winters, tennis, cricket. It's like yeah. kids dream if you love sport. Yeah. Every time we've caught up, you've been – before we've caught up, I've sort of interrupted you studying something. Like you're, you're looking you're, – you're researching something. You, you must have the most enormous brain. <laughs> well, I think because it's so small, I need to study a lot. I think the good guys with big brains don't probably do as much. But there is an enormous amount of reading and working – I think to do justice to the performers because whatever it is, winters, summers, a debutante, a 300 gamer, they've all got an incredible story that you need to do justice to. And I, as a parent, if I had a son or a daughter performing, I'd want those talking about them to be well read. Mm -hmm. And you know, even coming in today, I know that you guys would have read, watched, done. And if you haven't, then you leave knowing that. And I think it's just a respect piece, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. I also think you're you're a very generous um... lover. <laughs> I hope I hope that you think I'm a generous lover. And if Soph is listening, see, <laughs> I told you, I told you, I am a generous lover. The words out, people yeah. know. But every time we've been together, I think that. <laughs> I was going to say host, but yeah, <laughs> I just feel like uh, you know watching you through the Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games uh, with your co-host, with the guests you have on. Uh, you had one of our former guests in Harry uh, in Harry Garside. Mm. Was a, he did a bit with you guys on the Com Games? He's a beauty, he? isn't he? Yeah. Sensational. Yeah. But but you were but you sort of you didn't say much. You just sort of handed over to him. Um, and, I, and I think you. I don't know where I'm going with this. I just, I just think you're really great with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, on that, so one of the, I think one of the great skills, and I'm not saying I'm a good host, but for those that are, 
the listening piece is much more important than the talking and you're only hosting to get the story out of the star that you're with. Mm-hmm. I think there is a slight um, confusion with some people that they feel the host is the star, which is absolutely never the case. Mm. So Harry's the Olympian and the Commonwealth Games and the, hopefully the future world champion. So let Harry speak and ask the questions. Like Paddy Cripps on Monday night, don't interrupt, let him go. Mm, he spoke yeah. so beautifully and he's got such a great story to tell. All you need to do is prompt and push and let them go. So I think it was Michael Parkinson said the most important part of the interview is the listening, not the talking Yeah, from the host's perspective. Mm. And oh. so this is probably not on topic for this, but I'm just interested. Do you therefore value like after a broadcast or after a show or something you've put together, you're judging it by how well you feel like you've brought out the the, the star, so yeah. to speak, or the, the sportsman, how much you've been able to bring out their sort of true essence as opposed to your individual performance sort of thing? Yeah, I, th- I think my if I can have them shine as bright as they can, mm. I've done well. Yeah. And, and that's all the work's done before the interview. So with Paddy Cripps the other night, uh, round 23, four of them could have won. Andrew Brayshaw, Took, Paddy, Lockie Neal. So at the start of the night, I had seven uh, Q&As ready to go because I thought there were six uh, – sorry, I had eight. I, there were six that I knew could win, and then Jeremy Cameron and Callum Mills I thought would be the roughies. By the sort of halfway through, I knew they couldn't, and then you got whittled it down. And the last round, I've got the four interviews ready there. Took Miller gets a vote, so I pick up his interview. He's leading. Then Lockie Neal passes him, so I put Took's down and pick up Lockie's. And then Paddy Cripps jumps Lockie, so I grab Patrick Cripps's. With all of them, you've spent so much time with them Mm. and had lots of conversations and talks and chats and refined and sort of I knew what was important to them to talk about and what they wanted to say. So if I could leave having had them say it, Mm. I'm happy. Yeah. But Bruce always said to me, Bruce, who is a god, by the way. I say never. For those of you not on a first name basis with Bruce. Bruce (laughs) McAvaney. It was actually Bruce Lee that I was going to talk about. Let's talk about Bruce (laughs) McAvaney. But Bruce McAvaney always um, said to me early on, he said, you'll only ever think about what you didn't say rather than what you did and it'll agitate you, but Mm. don't worry about that. But just on Bruce, they say never meet your heroes because they'll only let you down. When you Mm. meet Bruce, he goes from hero to God in 30 seconds. He's phenomenal. so nice to hear. Yeah, he's the best. That that is nice to hear. He's just amazing. Doesn't surprise me, but yeah. 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 He he is on the... uh, with yourself, he is on the A list of uh, guest dreams for yeah. us at the uh, at the Imperfects. Bruce yeah. McAvaney, I know, especially these two would uh, would have quite yeah. trouble speaking to him. There's something extraordinary about, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure. But I always talk to my kids about being interested. There's one thing is to be interesting, but be interested. And Bruce is unbelievably interested in other mm. people. Mm. So the first uh, text message I get on the morning of the Brownlow is from Bruce, six thirty a.m. Wow. And he says what he says. And when I went to my phone back to the room afterwards, the first message post Brownlow count was from Bruce. Jeez. And I said to him, I said, you are always thinking about everyone else. And, you know, he sort of didn't really respond to that. He, he's just learned the emoji. He put a smiling emoji <laughs> face. And he's only just learned about Google. So his career has been done with a handwritten notebook and reading. So Google's come into his life in the last few years. Oh. But he's so interested it is unbelievable. So he will say to me, how's Soph? How's Miller? How's Indy? How's Lex going? Is it Auskick yet? He knows their ages, their names. He knows where they're at in their life. And that's just not me. He would, you know, your story after he's heard it and then follow it for the rest of your life. Wow. Same with but, you, Ryan. And but, then, just, but I imagine Bruce McAvaney constantly has an IFB earpiece, just walking around with like researchers telling him things about people. Yeah. <laughs> Himself. His, wife, his <laughs> wife's name's Sophie. The eldest one is Miller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how's yeah. Sophie? <laughs> Miller? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, so, he's, he's as interested a guy as you'll ever meet, and that's what makes him so attractive in my my world. Yeah, mm, I can nice. imagine. So this is kind of I'm, I love that we're talking about Bruce McAvaney, but it has kind of ruined my gag. So this is the vulnerability. <laughs> it's the vulnerability <laughs> house. We have three questions. I added a fourth one just before, oh. just to be funny. And the fourth question was, "What is Bruce McAvaney life in like in real life?" Are you serious? <laughs> I'm serious. I just wow. I want to talk about this so much, and it's happened organically, and I didn't need to oh, just feed in there as a joke. That's a shame. Would have been funny, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, the answer is everything you hoped he would be, he is, and much more. So, so some people say to me, what is your favourite moment uh, on air? What is your favourite sport to broadcast? And the reality is it's moments, not sports. Mm. But the answer is always when you're on with Bruce. 
Mm. It's just unbelievable. It's just an, ab- an absolute thrill. What what makes it? Um, what what? Why? Why is it so? He's so. When I first got given an opportunity with Channel Seven in two thousand eight, I'd done no broadcasting at all. I'd mm. been standing on the side of um, polo grounds in dust with no one watching, just helping as a committee member, sort of get things going. And somebody said, "You should actually do some stuff on air." Went through a process, did some pilots, got thrown an opportunity, and they said, "What would you like to do before you go on air on Sunday?" I said, well, was there any way I could just have five minutes with Bruce? And I grew up idolising Bruce. I'm from South Australia, small country town. He was, you know, South yeah. Australian and calling the local football. Then he became VFL, then AFL. And so I meet with Bruce for 15 minutes. This is before a Friday night game. Always makes time. He never met me. He said, come in. So he said, I'll give you three bits of advice. First of all is um, do the preparation. Do this much. Mm. Mm. You'll only use this much, but you don't know which it is. So do it all. Mm. And that's been something that I hope that I've always done. And then he said, this is an odd one, but never go on air wearing anything you're uncomfortable with because you'll be so distracted that you won't do a good job. And he said on this, I, I spoke about Bruce just before, the Sunday morning text before the Brownlow, you don't need good luck, da, 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 da. Um, make sure the suit fits right, lots of love, Macca. You know, it's like, yeah. So he's still on that. And the last mm. piece, which was great for me, he said, don't try and be anyone else. Be the best version of yourself. If you try and be someone else, you'd be a very bad version of them. See, that's great. And yeah. it, was, it just gave me the confidence to be the guy that hasn't played, the guy that hasn't coached, yeah. the guy that you know, hasn't done. So I'm always asking and never giving opinions. And that's sort of as a, almost like a fan, but Bruce gave me the confidence to just do that. So it was yeah. great. He's, that's um, fantastic. Was that the question? Sport. I can't remember what the question was. Well, I think I think Hugh's just in, in happy life, yeah. having heard about Bruce <laughs> yeah. the, the footage of – so Ollie Hall wins the 1500 yep. over the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. And Bruce calling out – but then the footage of him celebrating afterwards, it's like – I don't know how it was captured, but it was like – it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. But he's just like pumping his fists and jumping up and down. There is no feigned enthusiasm. No. It is real – and it is because it wasn't for the camera. It, it was no, it, and 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 when, when Winks, so he was broadcasting the 2018 Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, and Winks was running in the Queen Elizabeth, and he said to the guys, "Can I just have a feed of the races as well?" So he's calling the athletics wow. <laughs> to the world, watching Winks, and he's sitting there slamming the table. I'm sure you better find a vision <laughs> yeah. and put it over this, but it's, it's phenomenal. And then you see the same vision. So if you said to me, "What is Bruce's great passion?" I would say Olympics and horse racing are on par. Winks is, he's married to Annie, who's fabulous, but if Annie decided to do something else, I think Bruce would move in with Winks. <laughs> and oh, he's just, he, Winks, for those who don't know, is a very successful horse. Yeah, sorry, yeah. just a phenomenon. And then, um, yeah, the Olympics, and he, you talk about backstories. He he knows every Kenyan and oh yeah, every Zimbabwean yeah. and Jamaicans, you know, the athlete's wife's name, the kid's name, their pet's names, where they live. It's like different level, different gravy. So yeah, that's why right. I love – so that, that's a question. Mm. Why do I love working with Bruce? Yeah. For all of those reasons, but yeah. then he's the most inclusive too. So I know this is absolutely off topic what we're talking about. But you <laughs> no, remember. let's go. Yeah. So, so, Bonus episode on Bruce. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. this is a um, sealed sort of side <laughs> edition. So on Friday nights for about five or six years, there was a 7 to 7.30 show that's still on, but Bruce and I would do the back end of it together called the Friday Night Countdown. And the last five or six minutes, Bruce would join before he'd pick up and host Friday Night yeah. Football. And I would say to Bruce, let's just talk about something other than football before you start talking about football again because it's – he said, great. I said, so we'll just, so about five years, he would just pick something that he wanted to speak about. So this Friday night, it was July just before Wimbledon. And he said, let's talk about Jordan Thompson. He beat Andy Murray at Queen's, which is the traditional lead-up tournament to Wimbledon on grass. Jordan Thompson, Australian, never really had huge success, but he beat Andy Murray, which was phenomenal. And Bruce said to me, so, Haim, let's talk about that. He said to me, do you know that Andy Murray had never been beaten by an Australian? I said, really? <laughs> he said, he's 17-0 and 0 against Australians. I said, did Rafa never beat him early? He goes, Numbers, but he knows every number. Yeah, <laughs> he would know your number, phone number. <laughs> off by heart. So he said he's seventeen and oh. I said, "What? Pat never beat him early. Leighton, no. Philippusis early, no." It's like, right, okay, yeah, wow. I'll, I'll lead you in. So we go on air, 
Bruce, what do you want to talk about? He said, let me take you to Queens. Jordan Thompson beat Andy Murray. He's a journeyman. He hasn't had great success. But to beat Andy in England on grass, phenomenal. Hamish, you said to me before we went on air, Andy Murray had never been beaten oh, by an Australian wow. before. I did not know that. Oh, wow. That is why Bruce is the greatest of all time. He tries to lift everyone around him and get them to he his really, level. That's incredible. He does it the whole time. That's incredible. So, so he, he, he wow. is That's the most lover. generous performer. <laughs> Very generous lover. <laughs> he's the most generous performer and he's so far above anyone else that I've mm. ever worked with. There's no insecurity issues. It's like, come with me. And he's, he and Dennis Cometti uh, was so far above anyone else they would always just help those below them. There's others that feel like, I hope mm -hmm. I don't lose my spot and aren't. Yeah. But they just took me under their wing. Like when I go to Perth, I went to Perth for the Fremantle Western Bulldogs game. First person I ring, Dan, do you want to have lunch? Yeah, you know, he's just, mm. he and he and Bruce, I think, changed sports broadcasting in Australia, really. Well, I was yeah, just wow. thinking, that. I was like, who was Bruce Mac Who was the Bruce McAvaney before, before Bruce McAvaney? Mm. I mean, I, I'm too young to, to know, but I wonder, was there, did he completely change the way I think he was the f – so there were beautiful broadcasters in their lanes, like Bill Collins with Racehorse Calling and Richie Benno with Cricket. But Bruce was the first, and Dennis did wonderful jobs at the Olympics and was amazing in cricket on radio. But Bruce was the first to say, I'll call Melbourne Cups for Channel 10, which he did. I'll host Melbourne Cups. I'll ho host the Brownlow. I'll call uh -huh. the Grand Final. I'll do Bathurst. I'll do the Olympics. Like there was nothing that he couldn't do, and when he mm. did it, he was the best at it. Mm. So I, you know, we, we get lazy or we get, I think, almost expectant there's going to be another Bruce. There won't be. Mm. And he's the best multi-sport broadcaster this country's ever produced. And I'd love to show – or I'd love someone to show me someone who's better globally. Mm. There yeah. was um, – after the Ollie Hoare race in the Commonwealth Games, the, I've drawn a blank on his name, the British um, – Lord Coe, Sebastian Coe and Daley Thompson all joined Bruce – Yes. For the interview. So you've got yes. the greatest of all time joined by the greatest of all time and then the greatest of all time, but they're only going to Bruce because they respect Bruce more than any other broadcaster in the world. Yep. So Ollie Hawes just won uh, and they've gone to him to talk about it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and also to explain what a significant moment it was. Yeah. They actually referenced, they said, um, this is the British feed. So this is the, the, the British commentary saying, um, and there is no one who knows more about athletics than the Australian commentator named Bruce McAvaney. And if you could see the joy in his yes. face right now, you'd wow. understand wow. what a moment this is. They actually mentioned him. Yeah. Yes, I was watching the British feed as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Amazing. Um, I heard, I was listening to Brian Taylor <laughs> the other night on on Dylan Friend's podcast. And, and he was talking about Bruce McAvaney as well. And he was talking about how on a couple of occasions, when you call the grand final, you want to be calling when the siren goes, because that's what people, when they watch yeah. the replays, they'll watch that part. Mm. And it's really nice to, to be the person who calls. And he talked, told a story about how with about 45 seconds to go, it was well within Bruce's right to continue. And he sort of looked at Brian and put his hand on his shoulder and said, over to you, Brian, and just gave him the last 45 seconds. Oh. I, I often think about that. Like Hamish, like when, when you're common, when you're commentating and you just have, because it seems, I don't know how commentating works, but I assume you're kind of constantly handing the baton to someone else and then they take a chunk and then someone yeah. else takes a chunk. Um, when you're commentating and the potential mark of the year or goal of the year or, you know, 100, you know, 100 meter sprint, you're probably not handing it to someone else. But, uh, <laughs> but when you're doing the commentary and something spectacular happens, uh, are you conscious of that about the fact that this is going to be replayed a thousand times throughout history? You, you aren't conscious when it's happening because it is all – like that, yeah. but you are. I'm sitting here very aware that there are moments coming up that I need to be right for in that preparation piece. And what you're hoping you do is do justice to these incredible moments. And you think about all the wonderful commentary that is left behind. Jezelenko, you beauty from yeah. the grand mm -hmm. final. Jezelenko, you beauty. Three words that have become iconic. You know, Leo Barry, you star. Mm. Aloisi. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Aloisi yeah. penalty goal. Yeah. I was like, who? Yeah. I don't know who that commentator is, but that. I would say like, oh, we see like yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that was it. Hole. Yeah. And yeah. so we, with Bruce, back to Bruce, just two pieces with Bruce. So you talk about BT getting handed the last piece of his first grand final with Bruce. 2016, Dennis Cometti's last grand final. He played VFL for the Western Bulldogs, Western Bulldogs versus Sydney. And with about two and a half minutes to go, Bruce said, take it home. And he did. And those two were a, yeah, they were a formidable and phenomenal combination. 
But to the point that you made around those moments, you hope that you get it right. Mm. I think Isaac Heaney won Mark of the Year. And when I called it, I thought, hopefully it's okay. And Jeremy Howe, a couple of big marks I've taken. You always want it again, mm. but you hope you've got it right. And you hope you're not distracted and talking to someone about something that just happened. <laughs> yeah, and you missed the moment. Oh, my God. Yeah. You, you yeah. Missed it. Yeah. But Richie Benno is the great master of the understatement. He, with the gadding ball, uh, Warren produces the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen. First ball in an Ashes in England. Mm. And he says, he's done it. <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then Gadding's walking off and he goes, Gadding has absolutely no idea what's happened. And Gadding yeah. keeps walking, he lets it pause and Gadding turns around thinking, yes, still doesn't know what's happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. When you watch that, when you watch that footage back, it is, I remember feeling like it's surprising how understated it is considering how iconic that moment now is. Yeah. But you, in the moment, yeah. L- last thing on Bruce, because I know you guys have got to go and get on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if it's about Bruce, we've got to ask. <laughs> so <laughs> Kathy Freeman was the 1997 and 1999 world champion, leading to the Sydney Olympics. She was always going to be the biggest story. Indigenous female world champion, home soil, expected to win. The moment just couldn't have been more perfect. Mm. And it was going to be Bruce who had to make the moment more perfect, regardless of the outcome. So he'd been broadcasting the athletics on that Saturday night for hours. But when she walked into the stadium, his whole mouth went dry and he couldn't speak. Like, oh, okay. So he had to grab some water and sort of say, need some time here. And then he thought to himself, I've done all the work. I'm going to get through this. He then produces the most extraordinary call. Mm. Exquisite. Yeah, it really is. For the most perfect race. And as she goes over the line, she, he says... What a legend, what a champion. And then Raylene Boyle says, what a relief. So Raylene knows it, mm. Bruce knows it. So when uh, Bruce was 60, I think, what am I getting Bruce for his 60th? So I get someone to transcribe the whole race, put the Olympic crest on top, the race, and then I find Kathy and say, can you sign it for me and get it framed? Amazing. Great idea. I mean, I got him the same thing, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get you that for Monday. Right. <laughs> thank you. So he says, thank you, da, 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 da. And then years later, I said, um, I was talking about the uh, call that Bill Collins had in the Cox Plate in 86, Bone Crusher. Uh, sorry, Kingston Town. He said, Kingston Town can't win, and he did win. I said, do you think Bruce would have been annoyed, uh, Bill would have been annoyed by that to Bruce? He said, no, it was perfect because t- Kingston Town couldn't win but did, and that's what made it extraordinary. He said, yeah. I said, have you got any regrets? He said, Kathy's race. Oh, what do you mean? He said, well, when she went over the line, I said, what a legend, what a champion. It was the wrong order. Champions become legends. Oh, like, oh my oh, God. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, don't beat yourself yeah. up. <laughs> it was the greatest call in the history yeah. of sport and he's still <laughs> thinking, order should have been the other way around. You know, that's why he's the best because he's just a perfectionist. Incredible. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, this is a vulnerability house. <laughs> yeah. and, um, we have as... not discussed anything we need to. <laughs> it feels like, I don't know how long we've been going for, but I feel like we can split it into <laughs> the 25 Bruce, minutes the on Bruce. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce yeah. 25. Yeah. Okay. The Bruce bonus episode will yeah. come out on Friday. Yeah. Hamish McLaughlin, mm. we have a, a deck of cards here, the vulnerability house cards. Uh, they are a stack of bluey cards, as you can see, but on the back of each card is a question, which hopefully maybe will invoke some level of vulnerability from yourself. How many do I take? Take, well, take three. Just I mean, take three. There, there is four there, but the fourth one I'd put there is, is what, a, what's Bruce, Bruce McEvaney like? Well, this is the fourth one. What is Bruce McEvaney <laughs> like in real life? <laughs> the last hour, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Okay. Three random cards. So if you would read them out loud and if any of them. How has money impacted your relationships? Okay. How did your mother and or father make you feel about yourself? Very lucky with my parents. When did your life get turned upside down and how did things change? Mm. So I just choose one. Just choose one, yeah. If, if, if any of them. Sparker. Thought. The Bruce one. To go back to that, do <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll go with this one. When did your life get turned upside down and how did things change? I'll probably cry on this one. You allowed to cry on here? We've, we've, um, there's been a lot of tears in this, a lot of sweaty yeah. eyes in this room. So mm, you'll yep. be fine. Yeah. Okay. Two significant, um, moments in my life where things went from calm and easy and privileged to completely different. The first was 
In 1997, Gil and I finished university at the same time. He'd done a five-year degree. I'd done a three-year degree. So that's Gil and your brother. Yep. Gil and, and, and we went traveling together. And I remember about eight months in, we were in a small country town in Argentina. We were working on a cattle station and Gil had done a reverse charge call home. And just phone call just went on and on and on. He kept saying for me, stay out, stay out. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, nothing. Like, something went on. He said, no, no, let's just, we'll get on with that. Let's go. And then about two weeks later, we travelled home early to surprise, um, to surprise mum and dad. And mum was in tears, and I thought that's worked well. That's great. Mm. And then the next day she was in tears, and the next day she was in tears. It's like, God, this has really worked well. Mm. Then a week later, she's still in tears. I said, "What's happening?" And she said, oh, "Father and I, are, you know, not going so well, and and we, you know, I think we're probably done." It's like, what do you mean? You're twenty. Seven years into a marriage, four of us, kids, all sort of thinking everything's perfect. How, how old are you at this point? 22. Gil's 24. Mm. And uh, it was just like a whole world that you knew had just exploded. And so we thought, Gil and I, that we would be able to get them back together and it would be all okay and it would be happy families again. And it just was never going to be. They tried to work through it. But what happened was – what we thought was going to be forever wasn't. And then we needed to find a way to make the best of the scenario. And as you matured, you realize that, and I'm married now, I'm uh, 2010, 12 years into a marriage. I used to assume that um, it was, they were happy and that they were always going to be happy together. And the more you sort of mature and the more you find your way forward, you realize that nothing's ever that easy. So, I sat down with dad and you know, you, I, I sort of don't want to talk so much about why they fell apart, but it's like, dad, you and mum have an obligation to get in the same room a lot and continue to parent us. Mm. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you guys may not live together and you may not love each other like you did, but the family is still the family and you need to have Christmases together. And you need to make sure that in all the significant moments, we are all together as a family because we nothing changes other than you two aren't living together. He said, I just don't think that's possible. I said, well, it is. You've got to get your head around it. And then Gillen, so Gillen said, we don't want lawyers. We don't want this to be an ugly uh, separation or divorce. And at 24, he took over the whole separation of his mother and father. Gosh. And he took over all the financial settlements and at 24, he became basically their parents. He CEO'd his parents. Yeah, I was going to say running the AFL doesn't seem so hard after. Yeah. Well, but yeah. this is the point. So and we'll get to the other in a moment, but it's amazing how these moments in your life steal you, wow. steal you, give you a different look at things. So the other two brothers were younger. So there's four brothers. Gillen's 24, I was 22. The other was maybe 18 or 19 and then the other uh, about 15 at the time. And after about six months of really hard sort of raw uneasiness, we said we were going to have Christmas together. And mum, who was really wounded, said, I don't think I can do it. And we had one Christmas where we didn't. And then the next Christmas we all got together. Mm. And we're all sitting at the Christmas table. Dad at one end. I was sitting on this side. Dad there, mum there, Gillen there. Another brother there, another brother here, and we just sort of Gil and I trying to tell stories and get it light. And that one lunch brought everyone back together wow. for some reason. And Ban showed I was Gillen's best man, he was mine. I was the MC at Banjo's wedding. The other brother, Will, was his best man. And Will Banjo was his best man. There were four really tight brothers. Bit of a slap in the face to you to not be asked to be MC. Uh. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Very flat. I thought we'd be a perfect family forever. Not the case. But what it's done is also showed that there's so many different ways to live. And, you know, I often say this, there's 7 billion people experience today differently. I look at dad now, he's very happy. I look at mum now, in the last three or four years, she's found a guy and she's really happy. Mm. And when we come together, everyone's really happy. I'm not sure that they would have been as happy as they are now I know they wouldn't have been if they'd stayed together, even though that's what we wanted. Mm. And it was just this, over the years, it's become very clear to me that uh, what you want isn't always what's right or what's best. And that proved to be the case. 
Because if, if you don't mind me asking, like probing, the when you were sitting down with your dad, and you all had this like intention, like you, we got to stay together. Mm. Like, what was? Because now you have the the hindsight and probably the 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 mature knowledge of knowing what this things happen. Um, but at that point, what was the sort of motivating factor of like trying to keep them together or trying to keep the family together? Well, I think everyone wants to be in a solid family that isn't separated. So you go home and your mum and dad are always there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. not in two separate houses and there's not another partner that comes into the life or two new partners. Like this is us. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't really like change either. I mean, we all like what we like and, you know, don't paint the wall. It's always been white, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think also we were always conditioned that, you know, you stay together and that's how it is and whether you like each other or not, you just continue to stay together. But mm. that's that's proven to be absolutely not right. And, I, you know, marriage is a complicated beast even when it's brilliant. You know, I'm married to Soph who I love unbelievably but it's not without its challenges. Mm. Speaking to you earlier, uh, Huey out there and he – Miller, who is the 10-year-old who I speak about, that's the second part about the life being turned upside down. Miller came into the kitchen the other day. She's 10. She said, you and mum okay? I said, yeah, good. Why? She's, she's a bit flat. You should give her a hug. Like, okay. Really? So I go and give Soph a hug. And she says, that feels better. I said, you okay? She goes, no, I'm not at the moment. It's like, well, Miller told me that. I missed it. I was <laughs> like, she said, oh, and explain why. And it's amazing how perceptive kids are. I, I thought mm. I thought mum and dad would be together forever and I missed all obviously the signs that were to the contrary. But. Yeah. Well, your – Banjo and what's your other younger brother's name? Will. Will. Were, were they – when you had that – when you and Gil were like, we've got to fix this basically, yeah. um, were they – part? was that front of mind? Were you sort of doing it for them or for yourself or was it – I think for everyone. I think, I think we were thinking, first of all, can we get – the marriage to remain solid and mm. mum and dad together. Then when we didn't, it was like we need to do this with the least amount of friction and angst and uh, that's what I think we were, were hoping the outcome would be. I think also we're quite a – not a private family but I used – sensible enough that it's like we've had amazing 27 years together. Four boys that are healthy and well and like let's do this – as it should be done, as opposed to you go to your corner, you go to your corner, call the lawyers. And I was never like that. So it was a, it was a, if you said, is there a way to do it well? I would say, yes, there is. We didn't do it perfectly, but it was nice that they could talk through everything. I remember dad saying to me, so mum was from Victoria and we we're living in South Australia and mum wanted to move back to Victoria because her mother was still alive in her late nineties. And we had all moved to Melbourne at that point for jobs, even though mum and dad were living in South Australia. So mum said, I want to buy a place in Victoria. So we said to dad, when mum finds the place, you'll pay, you'll buy it until she does get out of the house and mum can stay in the house. So they got to a point where mum was going uh, happy, found a place, wanted to move back to Birragara, which is sort of halfway point between Melbourne and where her mother was living, the Grampians in Dunkeld. I remember dad distinctly saying, and I've, a lot of my mates have separated since and I've given the same advice, all the material possessions that everyone fights over, they're all so insignificant. I remember dad saying, I said, so what are you going to do about all the stuff? He said, well, I'll, I'll drive to Perth, have a beer, come home and whatever's left's mine and whatever she's taken's hers. And it was mm. just such a good way to do it. It's like, yeah. he, had such great, he had such great respect for mum, but he also realised that the things mean so little. Mm -hmm. All the material possessions and all the things you gather over the years, like just there's nothing to them. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm really um, taken aback to a degree by you and your brothers. Like that, I would say that's not a normal reaction for a 22 year old no. to go. No, we're going to jump in and we're going to take this on. Mm. I I know if I had to go through that at that age, I would probably put my head in the sand or go and drink, drink lots and party lots to try and avoid the mm. pain of what was going on. Where do you think that determination comes from to, to go, no, we're going to jump in and try and fix this or where the, I think that's a pretty remarkable yeah. response to. I, I agree. I don't think it's very normal either. No. Mm. I feel like a lot of people, men in their early twenties would avoid, avoid, avoid mm. and just say, so I know I would. and I don't want to know. Just mm. Yeah. My old man was so we're on we're on the farm for those that 
don't know, sort of an hour and a bit over Adelaide, sheep, crop and cattle. And he had a philosophy of when it's light, go and work. And when it was dark, come back inside. And we had no TV during the week. You could watch the sport of the news, but that was it. And he was very disciplined with us. He was terrified that we would be lazy or lack integrity or have bad values or have a lack of respect. And he, we were a very fortunate family, but I wouldn't, I had no idea if we had a dollar or had none, you know, it was, that's how he fathered and he was very good at it. But he was also huge on addressing the problem rather than avoiding it. So if there was a drought or if there was sheep that needed moving or if there were a fence that needed fixing, like just get on with it. And I think that was a bit of him probably indoctrinating that in us mm. so that when the issue arose that was significant, it was still, let's just address this. This is a job. To yeah, it's a, it's, it, we've got to address it. There's, it. It won't get fixed unless you address it. And I, all of the good things in life come from either, I think, hard work or being really um, uh, open about it in terms of fixing problems. It, it wasn't articulated very, very well, and you can edit this up, but my eldest daughter, Miller, I've always said to her from about the age of three, are you okay? And she says, yeah, yeah. I said, are you happy? And she would say, yeah, yeah. I said, would you tell me if you weren't? She said, yeah, I will. Okay. So I've, I've always just, every three days, that's mm. the sort of the conversation. And I say it to Indy and Lex too, Miller and Lex, but Miller's more, she's a couple of years older. And I will say, make sure if you've ever got a problem, regardless of its size, you just tell me and we'll work it out. And I remember my mum saying that to me and I remember – she told me her mother said that to her and mm. her, her mother was a phenomenal lady and she was almost my social barometer. If I was thinking about doing something, I would think, what would granny think? Mm. Like, would she be okay with me making that decision? So mum, I said to mum, I said, like what? She said, well, if you steal something, you go to jail, you get someone pregnant, just tell me and we'll work it out. There is no problem that is too big. And I think mm. to your point, Josh, a marriage ending isn't unworkable. Mm. I mean, there's, there's this book that I'm, a couple of Josh, you're reading as well, The 4,000 4, Weeks. It's a book by Oliver Berkman, which who we're having on the podcast soon as a guest. But there's a bit in it where he talks about um, problems and how we, we, we spend so much time and energy and get so much anxiety trying to avoid problems or wishing that we didn't have problems. You know, just wishing, like, oh, I mm. wish I was just free of all these problems. But he makes the point, and I'm going to butcher it. He's probably written it a lot better than I'm about to say it. But he makes a point that like life is, if nothing else, what is life but a series of problems yeah. that you have to solve? And it's like you just, if you just lean into it and accept that there will be lots of problems, whether it's like, you know, as the smallest problems being, um, what collar will I wear today? Um, to like these sorts of huge um, relationship, interpersonal relationship problems which feel so big um, or like a, a wombat stuck a hole under the head. Like I've currently got a wombat digging holes under my house out in the country. So that's a big problem <laughs> and I'm just avoiding it. Mm. But to address it um, is it always, always feels best because more often than not, it solves the problem or at least sets your anxiety at ease. The other, the other thing that I find is you're sitting there thinking, oh, so many on or so many problems, write them down. It's like, That'll be done by 11. That'll be done by one. I can ring her and address that. I don't want to make that call, but I'll make that call. It's, it's like mm. they're so much bigger when you don't address them and don't actually yeah. put a program together to deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketballers of all time, was always criticized about being too hard on those around him. Mm. I remember I was doing an interview with him when he came to Melbourne and he said, um, I just wanted people to know how I was feeling and I just hated the lingering issues. Yeah. So, Ryan, if you have spinach in your teeth, I'll tell you, you have spinach in your teeth. Oh, as no. opposed to, do I? you do now. <laughs> Shit. But the point was just address it. And I say to Soph all the time, I should say, oh, this and this and this. It's like none of it has mm. any real significance. It's all, they're all going to be gone in 72 hours or a week or whatever. Like I remember somebody said to me, unless it's going to be impacting you in five years, don't let it bother you. Mm. So a great individual called Michael Gudinski died mm -hmm. and Gillen had, older brother, had a great relationship with him. And I remember he sent to the family WhatsApp group a great shot of he and Gil together and simply underneath it, it said, um, ignore trivialities. Mm. So 
a real problem, going back to when your life was turned upside down, was when I had an eight-month-old daughter who started having – so we went away for Christmas and then went to Byron Bay where my mother-in-law lives and then I came down to do the Australian Open tennis. And my wife, Soph, said, I think there's something wrong with Miller. It's like, what do you mean? She, well, she sort of twitches mm. and does it about ten times and then goes to sleep for four or five hours. And she's done it three or four times now. I can't get her attention and, and then, yeah, I'm saying, oh, it won't be anything. Don't, don't get stressed. Mm. First child, I had no idea. Then next day she's, I'm getting on a plane. I'm coming back from Byron. Let's go and see our pediatrician, Liz Hallam. So we go and see Liz and so cleverly has taken videos of what's been happening. I could just see her face just go white and she picks up the phone. And so, so there's the pediatrician. Pediatrician. Yeah. And she picks up the phone and then says to us, the head of neurology is waiting for you at Royal Children's. Oh, Jesus. It's like, what do you mean? She said, just go. I, I don't want to say anything, but they'll know. So I ring uh, Chris Jones, who was doing the tennis. I said, mate, I don't think I'm going to be in tonight. You know, I think there's something going on. And he's a great mate. He said, I'll sort it out. So we go to Royal Children's and a junior fellow opens the door and says, hey, Miss Sophie, I'm working with Jeremy Freeman, who's the head of neurology here. I'm just going to take Miller and we're going to do some tests. Like, what is happening? She said, I can't say anything, but there's 12 guys upstairs that are going to be monitoring Miller for the next two hours. We're going to put 35 electrodes on her head Whoa. and we're just going to see what's happening. It's like, can you give us a feel at all? She said, talk to you in a couple of hours. Like, oh. So we go into a, a, a you, room. Sorry, sorry, were you in a panic at this point? How oh, are you? The whole world's, yeah. you know, you, everything that was currently – the point ignore trivialities everything that you thought was important or an issue is suddenly yeah 15 rows back yeah. and shelved and never going to be an issue again so there's a spotlight right on this yep so we walk into the room and they start putting electrodes on miller and there's an ecg screen and lots of beeping and just so for nine miller and then two hours later a group of doctors and nurses walk in and I remember distinctly, Jeremy emerges from the pack and he said, hi, I'm Jeremy Freeman. I've just been monitoring Miller. Uh, she has West syndrome. 10% chance she dies in hospital. 80% chance she has brain damage for life. 10% chance she gets her unscathed. Oh, my God. I said, um, what was your name? He said, Jeremy. I said, we need to talk, obviously. Said, yeah. So we sit down and we talk and we talk and we talk and – he says at the end, um, so what do you want to do? I said, what was your name again? He said, Jeremy Freeman. I said, okay, this is Miller Freeman. Save her life. Mm. I said, what haven't I asked? He said, you haven't asked me if I'm the best in the world at this. I said, are you? He said, well, it's me or a guy in Canada and he's in here. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> he said, so what we're going to do is we're going to put her on a course of steroids. We're going to give four mils orally every four hours for 31 days. Oh, my God. But what will happen is within 24 hours, she'll have screamed so often and so loud because she'll have disliked the steroid so much, she'll have no voice box left. She won't be able to make any noise. And then within about 14 days, you won't recognise her from the swelling and uh, oh but you've got to keep wow. going for 31 days. She'll ha have an appetite that's so severe that she'll out-eat you and she'll become very heavy and then you won't actually recognise her as a kid in 31 days. He said, but that's all irrelevant. The piece that's critical is if she doesn't stop having seizures in the next six days, she won't. And she'll either have not made it or she'll not progress from sort of where she is now as an eight-month-old. Okay. So what are we doing? He said, well, I'll give the first. And then once she's had the first four meals, you won't be able to open her mouth by yourself, one of you will need to open her mouth up and the other will need to put in because she'll just almost get locked jaw. Like, okay, uh, let's get going. No, you, know, you, have no, you have no promises, there's no guarantees, you have no understanding of how this thing plays out. So the first couple of days, they're in hospital. Uh, we're all in hospital and we're doing it. And they say, listen, go home and do this. All you're needing to do is do the um, prednisolone four times and we'll have some um, home doctors and nurses come and see you, but go home. So we go home and then 
on the first day we make one phone call to Soph's side of the family and my side and say this is what's happening. And Gillen, talking about a guy that is unbelievable when there's a crisis. So he says, okay, I'll organise someone to be there at 7, 11, 3 and 7 for the four meals every day. I'll be there at 7 every day. So we either do the first course and Miller has six sets of seizures. And he said if it doesn't stop within six days, it won't stop. So six days is, that's your cutoff. Day two, four sets of seizures. Day three, five sets of seizures. And Gillen's doing the 7 a.m. Um, uh, dosage. Dosage every morning. Comes in on the fourth day and he grabs me. He's a positive guy. He grabs me and he says, takes her to the couch. He says, today's the day I won't have seizures today. Got a really good feeling about it. Today it stops. So I go to the fridge, get the pregnisolone, walk over to the couch and Gillen's just holding Miller in tears as she's having seizures in his arms. Like, hmm. Okay. So he says, how can this happen to someone that has had so little life? You know? mm. So day five, five sets of seizures. Day six, so Gil comes in, no one's saying anything. Seven o'clock dosage, 11 o'clock dosage. Three o'clock dosage, seven o'clock dosage, have a bath, put it to bed. I said to Soph, don't say anything. Day seven, day eight, no seizures. Day nine, we have to go see Jeremy Freeman day 14. We go in and with West Syndrome, what happens is the ECG scan, your brain pattern should be just doing that. When you've got West Syndrome, you've either got a brain cancer, a brain tumour, a brain lesion or... It's the same outcome, but none of those things. And the brain pattern goes from nice crystal clear TV to snow. And you just, it's ugliness on the pattern. Day 14, we go in and the ECG scan is clean and clear and terrific. Jeremy Freeman comes and says, listen, three months. I need to see you in three months because it can, in rare cases, click out again. Every day for three months. It's just, did she have a seizure then? Is it anything happen? Mm, no, like yeah. he's terrified. So it's just this constant watch, constant. Yeah. And did Jeremy the 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 doctor say this is looking good at this stage? Yeah. So he, he says he, he says it's fantastic. Okay. But come and see me in three months. I don't want to say anything. Just it's going really well. Yeah. Three months we go back in, hoping, praying. Thirty-five electrodes on a head, ECG scan, two hours of waiting. We go and then see Jeremy. And he said, perfect. But. In the States, there's been a scenario where it's, I come and see him at six months. So again, there's just this uneasiness and we get to six months and we go in and she takes a highlight off the um, counter and keeps it with her and we go in to see Jeremy and he said, where did you get the highlighter? I said, just from your front desk. He said, I'm going to do some cognitive tests and see how we go here. So he does a whole heap of different things and he said, I'm not going to put her on the ECG scan. He said, she's just passed tests that three, she's at 14 months now because she got it at eight, six months down the track. I've just done cognitive tests that three-year-olds don't pass. When you have West syndrome, there's normal development, which doesn't happen for too many that have got West syndrome. And then there's abnormal development, which is where I expect Miller to be. And then there's supranormal development. Miller's just passed all of these tests that sit her here. It just doesn't make any medical sense at all what's happened with your child. Mm. She's a medical miracle. Wow. So I'm crying and so crying. It's like, so that whole series of events makes everything look easy. Mm. To mm. your point, one bad under the house, we'll sort the one bad out. Yep. Brown low metal, can you muck it up? Of course you can. Does it matter? Absolutely not. Mm. Did you get the moment right with Isaac Keeney? Not really, but it, there's nothing anymore that worries me. And before that, I think I'd probably lapsed from the mum and dad stuff a little bit to be worrying about things. But now it's like, there is no concerns. Like, mm. so if we'll get upset about something or worried about something, it's like, really? So Ange Cunningham, who's a great mate of mine, was diagnosed with MND and she was one of the first, I'd never heard of MND until she was diagnosed. And then Neil Danaher was diagnosed at the same time. And Ange passed away very quickly and Neil continues to fight unbelievably in his eighth year. But I remember uh, I said to and Ange just lost everything except her eyes and her ability to move her eyes and she was just such a phenomenal woman. 
And uh, I remember it was my birthday and it was about 18 months into her diagnosis and she sent me a text and said, using her eyes, saying, happy birthday. Um, I hope it's a fun one and a good year ahead or something like that. And I said, can you believe it? Um, getting old, feeling old. And she just replied back, what a privilege. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, when, when you were telling... Uh, I can't, as a dad, I can't, I mean, anyone listening, I think without kids couldn't help but be so moved, but especially as a, as a dad of a, of two young boys. Um, but when you were telling that, that story and there was a moment, I think it was on when you talked about the fifth day and Gil had come around and it seemed to really affect you. Um, for those, if it doesn't, didn't come across on the mic, it really affected you that moment. I'm sort of, I hope this isn't probing too much, but what was it about that, that was it the act of your brother? Because I um, get emotional thinking about what my brother would and what I would do for my brother. Was it that? Was it the lack? Was it the feeling that this might not work out? What What was it that? Probably both. Like mm. Gil is very pragmatic and very, like we, we were IVF for... Uh, I think it was 19, 20 months to get Miller. And I, we thought we're buggered here. We're really battling. And we got down to the final round of our first batch of eggs. And Gillen said, you'll get pregnant. Just stick to the process. Are you doing everything you need to do? And he was right. We got pregnant and had Miller. I think, I think when it hit me, to your point, Josh, was that Gillen is so pragmatic and practical. When I saw him in tears... It was an acknowledgement of this is really serious. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Like there, there isn't a guarantee here. Mm. Yeah. And he'd said moments before it was going to be okay. And then he realized he actually had no control over it at all. Yeah. And although he's very good at getting outcomes, this one was with the gods. Mm. And he couldn't control it. I couldn't control it. So I couldn't control it. Whatever anyone said was just sadly lip service. It was we're behind you, it's going to be okay. It's like, you don't know that. So, and the, to see Gil cry, he's, he's, not, he's not a guy that cries a lot, but to see him with tears in his eyes, sitting on the couch with a child that hadn't done anything in life mm. yet, like the whole life was ahead of her if it worked out or not, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was tricky. Tri and then you look back at it now and, Soph and I were always good, but we're better. Um, our family, mum, dad, Gil Banj, like we understand how privileged we always are, but how lucky we are now to have had gone through that and not had a bad outcome like it could have been. Yeah. Um, we have families. We did something. We've done a lot to try and sort of help others and people will ring and say, oh, my child has West Syndrome. So how, how is it going? And you get such different stories. It's like, mm. So you, you continue to be um, reflective on your good fortune. The good fortune is particularly interesting and powerful, I think. In for, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying not to psychoanalyze you because I'm not an expert and we don't know each other, but the you, you guys did absolutely everything you could do to save your daughter um, and sounds like the only way that you and your brother and your wife and family know how is to do the job well and do it properly. But there's a moment there where you realize that it doesn't matter how much you do here, there's a certain amount of fate that's going to take over mm. here. Was that an acknowledge? was that something you always knew or is that something you've now learnt and is that a lesson that you carry with you or is it just sort of back to let's just do the job as well as we can? Yeah, I think... I think probably you learnt that there's some things that are completely out of your control. Mm. Um, and there's, there's some things you can't, I don't think you can um, computate and come to terms with. Ange Cunningham getting MND, Neil Danaher, or a young child getting cancer. It's like, I, I don't understand how that script gets put together. Mm. And if you can sail close to the breeze and get away with it, like we did, it's like, you, you don't feel, 
Oh, it's not embarrassed, but it, you, fortunate probably. Like, so when other mothers and fathers ring me and say, this is where we are at, and, and I don't, I try and give them hope, but there is no certainty. Mm. And the fact that Miller now walks into my bedroom in the mornings or at night, or I get to hold her hand and put her on the bus, it's like, When you um, spoke before about Gil coming over to your house, um, we were chatting before just off air. Penny and I, have, as parents, have been having some struggles of late. And we had a day the other day, which is a good day. And we went to the park with Josh and his family and, um, and seeing Josh and how much he cared what we were going through. Um, and all we did was go to the park. <laughs> That's all we did. Yet it was so just seeing how much my brother had my back. I can't begin to imagine what it feels like to have your brother turn up, your big brother turn up at seven o'clock every single morning in your darkest hour, darkest day, darkest week. The feelings that must, the feelings of love you must have for your brother must be just um, immense. Yeah. The, the other piece of it, I guess, is how lucky you are to have a family full stop. You know, there's, there's others that don't have brothers, don't have a relationship with their brothers or their mothers or their fathers. You know, I, my mother and father are incredible. You know, I speak to mum pretty much every day. Dad will send, he's a very good letter writer and he'll, he'll write incredible things and in his understated way. But to have a family around you that is able to guide you, wrap their arms around you and help you get through whatever it is, what a, you know, whether it's Josh or Gillen or Banjo, I've got three brothers. It is, um, it's incredibly fortunate. And I feel so sad for those that don't, you know, in, in their darkest hours. And it's amazing the human um, psyche and what you are able to cope with when things get really dark. Mm. I remember after, what we, you know, after being diagnosed and then at that sixth month marker, What, what we went through didn't seem to be significant until you look back because you were just in it. Mm. I think when you're in the storm, you're trying to find a way to get to shore. And we were doing that. But when you look back and see how dark the clouds were and how angry the waves were and what was in the water, it, was, it sort of probably only dawns on you then. But without Gillen and Banjo and Will and Mum and Dad and the friends and the family and, God, it's amazing also how suddenly Jeremy Freeman – and Daniel Golshevsky, the two doctors that I spoke with every day, Roger Federer's poster comes down and Jeremy goes up yeah. and next to it's Daniel <laughs> Golshevsky. And, and I still am in contact with them all the time. So Miller, the other day, I don't know quite how, but she won Victorian Ski Championships doing something the other day. I was tears and crying. And then we went to the Nationals and I was taking videos and I was just sending it to Jeremy and Daniel. I said, Look what you've allowed to have happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they both reply back immediately. Like they, they've got this great sense of journey with her. And yeah, you just, there's so many brilliant people in the world. Without Jeremy Freeman or Daniel or those that found that pregnisolone can save and can help, it's like, God, we're lucky. I mean, yeah. and I remember watching a Seinfeld episode. Uh, Seinfeld, um, uh, he was being interviewed. He was talking about how lucky he is you know, and, and to savor every moment, to savor the peppermint tea with good people and to. Yeah, the fact that you got shoes on and you can walk out into a car that drives to a house that's warm and yeah, you know, it's like we take so much for granted. Mm. Um, yeah. The I mean, the thing that I guess a lot of people, as you're sort of talking about, a lot of people, and I think to a certain degree, myself included, take for granted the relationships that you have with family members. Mm. Um, and and I imagine, I guess this, I guess this is a question. Did did that experience the with with Miller? Um, did that change? You're obviously already really close to to Gil and to Sophie and um, to everyone in your family. But uh, did it change or change your perspective at least on your relationships? Did it change your relationships with Gil and with Sophie and the way that you approach them? I don't think it changed them, but it reiterated how strong they were. If that yeah. makes any sense, so. I'd always had a remarkable relationship with everyone in my family, but because it had always been 
you sort of just took it for granted. Yeah. I see others. Somebody said to me the other day, oh, are you jealous of Gillen? It's like, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, he's done so well. It's like, I'm so happy for him. What a clickbaity question. Yeah. <laughs> but, do, yeah. Do, but do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I don't even know how you would think like that. So yeah. I just have this amazing love for three brothers and they've all married beautiful people and mum and dad are, you know, it's like, it's just sort of, I say to my kids, I said, there's, there's a couple of rules in the house. You're not allowed to say hate. And the three um, most important things to be are to be kind, to be kind, and to be kind. Mm. And they sort of live that. And we were speaking you know, last night. You're, you're, I said earlier in the podcast, he, so my father, we used to call Singlet because he was always on our backs. So I said that earlier that he's just a tough guy. You know? Singlet is yeah. a great nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming it's his nickname. Yep. Yeah. 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 Angus. Angus, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So Gus uh, was always terrified that we were going to become – sloppy you know and so he was always tough and he used to sort of we we i joked in uh, my wedding speech that we grew up with he sort of looks a bit like clint eastwood but it was a clint eastwood dirty harry version mm. but as the years went by and he realized that we were going to be okay he sort of softened and now it's the clint eastwood from bridges of madison county oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. he, he's now like he goes send me a photo of military how did you go it's like it's just it's just constantly wanting to be involved where it was used to be, I've got to make sure that the kids are right and there's you know, mm. kids at school and it was sort of, he was always preoccupied. Um, and yeah, he, he's, he's just a guy that, um, showed us the way and showed us a path forward. And, uh, he, he sent me a text the other night after the brown light. He said, uh, very proud of you and Gil. I've never watched the brown light. Now I never want it to end. Yeah. Well done. You know, it's like, yeah. and yeah. it's just, it's funny how you navigate through, I think he was a tough bastard, but he wasn't. He just wanted you to be all you could be a bit, I think. He must've been sitting back watching going, I think I've done a pretty good job here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As a sport, if you're a sport loving person and your two sons are essentially running the Brownlow <laughs> medal, <laughs> yeah. pretty good. Uh, it's pretty, that's pretty remarkable him to allow himself to mature into that. Because a lot of people don't as well, I reckon. Like a lot of, I'm not that I'm saying your dad was a tough bastard, but a lot of people are tough bastards seem to toughen up harder yeah. as they get older and become tougher bastards as they get older. We, we um, he, so one of the parts when the marriage broke down, we said, Dad, you got to buy back in here. If you want this to work, you need to buy a phone, ring us, jump on planes, come and see us because we're in Melbourne, he was in Adelaide. And he sort of thought about it, obviously, and he realised that, you're right. And now he's, he's got complete buy-in all the time. And if, if his phone number comes up and says, Dad, it's like, do I have an hour here? <laughs> Whereas I used to, this is a true story. I used to, I was at boarding school. And back in the day, you would ring Telstra. You'd reverse charge call back from the boarding house. I remember Dad, would be terrified he was going to pick up. It was mum. You'd talk for half an hour. It was Dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll get your mother. <laughs> but one night, mm. uh, I remember it distinct. Hi, it's Jenny from uh, Telecom Hamish with a reverse charge call. Will you pay for the call and accept the charges? Reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of his dry sense of humour slash you're a dick. But, <laughs> yeah, now it's – I remember I was sitting by – by chance, he and I ended up in Europe together at the same time. And this was seven years after he and mum had separated and he had a new partner. And I was going out with a girl. We ended up – Similar spot. They and one other family, they all wanted to go into Siena and do some shopping, and I'm not a shopping guy. I said, Gus, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here. I said, I'll stay, said, I'll stay with you. And they all went off. So at nine in the morning, we sat on a chair by the pool and just started talking. I don't think I've ever talked to Dad for more than an hour without being interrupted in my life. We sat there for eight hours made sandwiches and just talked under a tree, legs in the pool, in and out. I remember saying to him, what's the biggest regret in your life? And he's a very um, considered guy. He paused and about a minute later he said, the obvious answer is the marriage breakdown. Mm. He said, but it's not my biggest regret. Ooh. He said, when I came back from university, he went to uni in England. He came back to meet with his father and he studied law in, at Cambridge. 
and he came back and the whole way home he was said, Dad, I'll, you know, can we have lunch on next Wednesday? And he was going to come back and say to his father, who thought that he wanted to run all of the farms, Dad, I don't want to run the farms. I want to be a lawyer. Lands, goes to lunch. He's built it up, built it up, built it up. I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him. Sits down. His father says to him, great to see you. All the farms are ready. Um, bring the managers whenever you want. He says, okay. He said, I've been farming for 50 years and never wanted to. Oh, wow. Jeez. That's... So he's, he, he's gone down this path through a sense of obligation. So what he said to us was. And, and you never knew that he never didn't want to. Wow. So. He, without me knowing or Gil knowing or Banj knowing, Will knowing, lived with that. And, and, and I'm not saying that he has had a hard life. It's been a wonderful life, but it wasn't what he wanted to do. And he said that to me. And he was so brilliant in his planning that he said, you guys can all come back to the farm if you want. You've got to go to uni. you got to work for someone else for a couple of years. Then if you want to, let me know. Mm. And he knew by the time we'd gone through uni and done other things, we'd probably see more of the world. And if we really wanted to, then that was a good thing. And so Gil did his thing. I did my thing. Ben did. The other youngest brother, Will, went and did some other things and went back to the farm. But he just wanted to know that no one felt a sense of obligation to go it's back amazing. to the farm. Yeah. It really is. It really, I mean, it's just like one of those great, I guess, gifts that parents you know, if, if they've had struggles with their own parents mm. to not repeat and to kind of like yeah. be conscious of it and to not repeat that cycle or pattern. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Mm. I, um, I've i loved today. I feel like I could chat. Well, I, I feel know. like I listen to you for hours. I mean, I do listen to you for hours. I watch the Olympics <laughs> and the Commonwealth Games and I love it. <laughs> Can I ask one question? Yeah, you, of course. You're yeah, about yeah. to wrap it up. I, it, it seems um, quite pertinent. Or I think that's the right word. Um, yesterday I was listening to um, – uh, it was a reference to an original comment by um, a, 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 a thinker, um, an author called Sam Harris, and he was making the point about being in the moment and appreciating the time you've got. And he and it made me well up. I, it doesn't take a lot to make me well up, I must admit, but it made me well up and get very emotional because he said there'll be a there'll be a last time that you ever pick up your child. Um, and you don't know when that time's going to be. You don't know when that was the last time. Um, and going through what you went through with Miller would have, I'm sure, put a microscope under the appreciation of who Miller is and that she's around more than a normal parent gets to experience. Does that um, appreciation, do, are you able to maintain that appreciation to this day? Does it waver? Does it come back? Like how do you... Because I, yeah, I, I'm just fascinated how you how that sits with you today. That that was in two thousand January two thousand and thirteen, Miller's sort of six month when she was diagnosed was January and went for six months. I've never once looked at her or any of the other kids and felt anything other than an unbelievable sense of um, appreciation as to their health. Mm and their well-being and how it could have been so different. And I was watching Miller the other day do something. I was just crying. So I said, you're right. I said, look. And she started crying. It's like, and, and my father said to me years ago before I had kids and it didn't resonate with me like it does now, but he said, you're only ever as happy as your unhappiest child. And that, I think, was sort of compounded then. And I look at them all. I was on the couch last night with them and I said, listen, I need, I need some help with them. I love, I love getting them to buy into things. I said, I need to write this opener for the weekend. Where are we starting? And I showed them some vision I had to write to. I said, what are we saying? And they all did it together. And I was piled on me and on the couch and Lex was kicking me in the nose and Mila was you know, sitting on my leg. I could hardly type. And Soph took a photo of it. She said, that's not the perfect environment to work and do what you need to do. I said, it is the perfect yeah. environment to work mm. and do what I need to do. I've never been happier than having three healthy kids on my lap mm. last night. Like one day they won't be living in the house. They won't be wanting to be on my lap. There'll be someone they love more than me in their life and they'll have kids. Like now is this perfect world where they want to be with me, they listen to me. Miller said, can I sleep with you? 
<laughs> like it's just one day she won't, you know. Yeah. So so yeah, it's to your point. Um, I don't take anything for granted with the kids, and I I realise that um, things could be different, and they are for others. And shit, I'm lucky. Yeah. Wonderfully said. It's a beautiful place to finish today. Hamish, thank you so much. It's, yeah, I love listening to you speak and you've been very generous with um, sharing your family's journey um, and I love where you're at at the moment. It's, it's, very, it's very special and as a dad, it's quite aspirational as well, I yeah. have to say. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, mate. And good luck for not just the weekend, the grand final, um, but for everything you do. And I look forward to following your, your journey because I watch a lot of sports, so I watch a lot of you <laughs> and, and I love it, so... And and yeah. it's and I also add that like you know we've only just met for the first time today, but I think like it's just another and I I'll never stop being surprised about this like the how like powerful it is when someone just tells their story. It's such an obvious thing to say, and and it's what we do. It's like what the podcast is all about. But like I respected you immensely as a broadcaster, and you know what you do, what I watch you do on footy Olympic games. But I think now just it's so fast. We've only known each other for a couple of hours. But I, I, I just have so much admiration for you and respect. And I've learned so much from you, I think. And just just from having this conversation and just from you talking about what you've just spoken about. So I guess thank you for that. But 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 also just 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 to acknowledge that, that just that, that the vulnerability like that, and this is the vulnerability vulnerability house, but uh, God it works. Mm. <laughs> as far as like I just feel I feel quite connected to you now yeah. in, in you telling that story and, and um, yeah I just feel like I know you in, in, a, in, in, in a way obviously that I didn't before which mm. is uh, which is pretty amazing so thank you so much keep doing what you guys are doing I love listening to the stories but you're giving a lot of people a platform to talk but in turn you're giving a lot of people a platform to listen and change and heal and move forward which is critical Thank you, Hamish. Thank you. Thanks, Hamish. Thanks, Hamish. Cheers.